Soviet design, put simply, was brilliant. You could choose any field or medium from any time period. Their constructivist beginnings, influenced by Russian folk art and industrial worker movements, grand social artwork steeped in radical political theory and the Russian avant-garde, to their triumphant space art, their cosmic iconography and psychedelic incandescent dreams of space, to their staggering architecture, from the stylings of Art Nouveau and the neoclassical revival, to the brooding, brutalist structures of post-Stalinism, the stark beauty revealed through exposed, untreated concrete, and be overly inundated with the wealth of some of the most alluring and awe-inspiring visual marvels ever made. But I think it's the industrial and commercial product design, spanning from the period of the 50s to the USSR's decline in the late 80s and early 90s, that was by far the pinnacle of what Soviet design had to offer the world. Marked by an emphasis on functional sustainability and advocacy for cultural and scientific advancement, the designers, engineers, and thinkers of this period in Soviet history were some of the preeminent experts when it came to crafting living, breathing cultural artifacts, imbued with the design ethos that formed followed function, with a visual and political appeal that started with the Venite. Established in 1962, the All-Union Scientific Research Institute of Technical Aesthetics, through its creative production apparatus, served two main purposes. One, to improve the overall quality of Soviet products and goods, their design and functionality in the hands of everyday consumers, and two, to decrease the growing gap between the Soviet Union and its industrial Western rivals, a process that began by borrowing much of what great Western designers had already created, reimagining and retooling them through the lens of both Soviet ideals and the specific material conditions of the USSR, radically changing the way we would view the political and practical function of design in society. We see this in the mundane and ordinary, the everyday objects that populated Eastern Bloc homes, offices, and public spaces, from durable space-age vacuum cleaners to confectionery wrappers and children toys. Soviet design stressed a kind of stylistic practicality that went from their packaging to the products contained within them, and more than just being practical, they reinforced sustainability at every turn. Take these for example, the popular Avosky fish bags used widely throughout the Soviet Union's reign. Made from recyclable, netted materials, they could fold easily into pockets or bags and be washed, made with extreme durability in mind. Our modern sustainability trends have made the style of bag become on vogue again. Or these wide neck dairy bottles with aluminum caps, unlabeled, fully recyclable, and produced with minimal resources. Their contemporary clean packaging is the envy of the green companies that fill our grocery shelves today. As we move into some of the more ornate packaging and product design, we begin to see touches of artistic motifs from socialist realism, a Soviet art movement based in Marxism that sought to politically align the cultural art produced at the time with the state's own revolutionary history and development. This often took the form of dramatic, idealized portraits of Soviet leaders portrayed in striking compositions. When it came to design outside of fine art, much of it sought to create the same emotional connection in consumers those canvases elicited. These philosophies extended from the ordinary to the more luxury products of the period, from Georgian wine labels adorned in cursive typography to elegant wine boxes and soft drink design. A woman's handbag alone could contain an entire world of design within it. In the stunning perfume and makeup collections stylized as sexy cigars and atomizers, we see breaks from more utilitarian design philosophies. With elements of Art Nouveau frills and geometric constructivist patterns, they serve as handheld idols to a goddess of elegance and sophistication. And in the shaving kits, pipe tobacco, and cigarette tins of the period, we're reminded that cigarette cool was a force that went deeper than American advertising. Even the Soviets found it a vice worth overly indulging in through design. In praising these products, we of course must draw comparison to the work they were borrowed from often German, Italian, and even American designers. This sewing machine by Tula takes after German counterparts of the time, featuring an electric drive and sleek chrome accents, though most Soviets preferred hand models by Zinger. And this VN10 UP4 desk fan, designed by Reynold Weiss, bears a remarkable similarity to the Braun HL1, Weiss having worked as deputy designer at Braun under the formidable Dieter Bohr. We know it's worth noting why the Soviets imported so much design rather than work off their own original concepts. 
with a lack of professional design training in the Soviet Union, spread thin after fighting two world wars and a revolution, the country's infrastructure was simply not advanced enough for the Soviets to commit major resources towards manufacturing their own products. And so in the early days of V-Night, sample product rooms became the true birthplace of the Soviet contribution to design, a process that involved engineers buying Western consumer goods, studying products they liked, taking them apart, and copying them with the materials available. This sped up the process of their major goal, producing good functional design that could find itself in the hands of Soviet people immediately. As their own industrial infrastructure burgeoned more throughout the 70s and 80s, they were far more well equipped to make and eventually export their own designs. Where they weren't lacking in terms of infrastructure, however, was their graphic work, from magazines to film posters. In the same way capitalist advertising reinforced consumerist culture through the lens of design, Soviet advertising and marketing was one of the crucial ways that state ideals could be spread and reinforced to the people. Whether it was the cutting-edge tech depicted in Soviet Life magazine or the latest fashions in gum, a peek into the Soviet's visual history reveals that beautiful design and beautiful people could sell clothes as much as they could ideology. And attention to graphic detail was something that was always prevalent in the Soviet approach to visual iconography. The dreamy graphic work of Myron Lukyanov is a testament to this. His movie posters were especially evocative and alluring. This one from the film White Son of the Desert is one of my favorites. The sweeping, curved typography following the shifting dunes of the sands, the usage of deep, rich colors reinforced by strong, heroic imagery is unparalleled. The horse is in perpetual motion, a gunman striking a pose full of western sentimental bravado. At the bottom, an ominous head peeks out of the sand, a scowling expression on his face, blinded under the hot desert sun. It's singular. Besides the emphasis on bold imagery that prevailed in their cultural phenomenon, Soviet design was also well defined in its advocacy for tech and exploration of scientific fields of advancement, starting from an early age. Modular construction kits gave children early access to electronics, a provocation that would extend later in life to the stylish tape recorders and gramophones of the USSR's own digital information age. And the T2 made in Leningrad through design alone represents the changing shift from radio to the television age, its Art Deco Stalinist era motifs concealing its newer age tech. This modular computer system by Sphinx takes the cake for me though. Seemingly born out of a sci-fi dream, something left over from a Star Trek set maybe, its beauty overwhelmingly outweighs some of its edgier impracticalities. Disco ball stereo speakers, funky headphones, two removable touch displays, I mean look at this thing. It's hard not to get envious. As Soviet design moved from the more decorative Stalinist approach to this elegant functional Soviet modernism, we also note this radical shift in the USSR's philosophy and approach to design. Now far more well equipped to meet the demands of the Union and more, Soviet design could serve its people as much as it did a wider world that appreciated it. This was especially true on the technical front. From alarm clocks, watches, and even cameras, the Zenith E was immensely popular, with 8 million units produced over the course of its lifespan. It was the Soviet Union's most exported camera. When it comes to exporting design, however, there's no bigger world stage than the Olympics. Their mascot for the 1980s Summer Olympics, Misha the Bear, was a smash hit. Made by talented children's author Viktor Chizikov, his soft furry appearance and full face representation was incredibly popular amongst viewers and visitors, increasing their emotional connection and engagement a connection that was just as represented in the USSR's social awareness posters, which advocated for all fields from textiles to technology to space exploration. Truly, when it came to design that was either transported globally or spoke globally, nothing could overshadow the indelible mark of power, of elegance, of quality that the very best Soviet design had to offer. When we take further note of the blueprints and prototypes, the designs that never left the cutting room floor, we're given an even clearer picture of the brilliance that transcends our modern perceptions of design. We stand in their shadows now, the name and unnamed people at teams that worked at V-Night and other design houses, the forces that encoded their design philosophy into the cultural artifacts that continue to astound us, artifacts that emphasize sustainability in a world of excess and waste, functionality in a world of overt gaudy luxury, and emphatic dreaming for a better future that extended from our worlds to the unknown. In bearing witness to these Soviet creations, I'm reminded that their ethos, just like their expressive design, was more than just a relic of the distant past, but an enduring mark they leave on a world 
that thanks them. Mind Theater is a solo effort produced and written by me, Ao Akinbade. For only $3 a month, you could support the show on Patreon. It really helps a lot. Link is in the description box below. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you next time. Thank you.